Oh, it's going fine. Fine. How about you? You want to talk about fish? Hey, everyone. John here from the Cast and Spirit Podcast. Today, we have Dr. Milton Love from the Love Lab at UC Santa Barbara. We cover a host of different topics, including how he got into fishing, his research in terms of rockfish and, and oil rigs, and so much more, including if you're thinking about getting to marine biology, even later in life, he talks about how he can do just that. So let's jump into the conversation on how he got into fishing. So my name is Milton Love. And I'm a research biologist at the Marine Science Institute at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And, uh, well, I, I got interested in marine biology when my dad took me fishing on the Malibu Pier uh, when I was six. So that's about uh, 1953. And uh, I was just hooked on fishing from that point on. And apparently soon after, according to family lore, I, was, uh, I announced that I was going to be a, an ichthyologist, a fish biologist, you know, when I was like, whatever, six years old. And I didn't have uh, sufficient imagination to change my mind over all these, all these years. And uh, I think it's safe to say that I, uh, particularly in my teenage years, I did nothing but uh, fish either on the Santa Monica party boats or on the pier or surf, you know, surf fishing, or uh, unsuccessfully chase uh, girls when I was uh, a teenager. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time on uh, on the party boats, and when I didn't have enough money to do that, I'd sit on the pier. Or even if I didn't want to fish, I would just... We only lived, uh, I don't know, a mile from the Santa Monica Pier, so I'd just walk over there almost every day and, and watch people fish. It was just like... Uh, it was really a good experience. And in the in the 50s and 60s, there wasn't near the number of people that you see now on, on that pier, so it wasn't terribly crowded. and uh, It was just a great experience. And the people, of course, if you're ever around piers or if you're ever around docks, the, the people that hang out along the, the coast are just like some very eccentric folks. It's really an interesting experience. <clears throat> and then um, for my Ph.D. work at the university here, uh, I, uh, part of it was to examine what fishes were caught on the, uh, on a single party boat over the course of three years. So I, I went out every single week for three years, just about, and identified and measured every single fish that was caught that I, I could, and, uh, also, uh, recorded where they were, where they were caught. So that was great sport. I got to know all the sport fishing skippers who, who ran that one boat, uh, the Hornet. And there was five or six over the course of that time. And again, between those folks and the deckhands, oh my goodness, what a, an interesting collection of humanity. I, I saw people get really, really good deckhands at, uh, at uh, cheating on the jackpot. I saw a, a sheephead that was uh, caught on day one, let's say, and that was used for the jackpot at least five straight times before it started clearly looking like a, a really dead sheep head. So there, there was great. and uh, uh, There was a fair amount of dope smoking at the time. This was in the 70s, and I remember one time we were leaving the harbor at about 7 in the morning, and deckhand, I was up in the, up in the bridge because, like, I was the only um, – person who was there every single you know week deckhands came and deckhands went and skippers came skip and skippers went so i quickly became friends with whoever was running the boat deckhand handed me a joint and of course my greatest concern was the scientific method uh could i uh measure fish accurately if i was ripped out of my mind and it and it turns out that you can but the the passengers kind of wondered what was so funny so uh, there was it was a an interesting time I must admit. So anyway, um, a, a, a huge amount of fishing. I actually was a commercial fisherman briefly in college, so I saw that aspect of the industry, and and still a huge fan of uh, of both industries. I mean, particularly recreational fishing. Uh, guy who works for me in my lab, Merritt McRae, was uh, owned a uh, sport fishing uh, party vessel for many years out of Santa Barbara, and then decided he wanted to be a biologist, but he still has close ties. In fact, he's a columnist for Western Outdoor News, so uh, the day doesn't pass when he and I and everybody else in this lab don't uh, 
talk something about uh, about fishing one way or, or uh, one way or another. So, what are you guys focused on in your in your lab right now? So, right now, uh, we are looking at, and we have been for the past ooh twenty years, the fishes and invertebrates that live on the oil platforms off California, and uh, just addressing that the question of uh, are these platforms important habitats for fishes in particular, but also for invertebrates. But we focus on on the fishes, and we've conducted surveys around most of the 26 platforms, not all of them, but most of them. And uh, we're still doing that. We got some fresh funds to, uh, to look at, uh, at some of these platforms in more detail and with other different tools. Normally, we use either scuba or a manned submersible, a little two-person submarine. The submarine isn't available anymore. Unfortunately, the guy who owned it went insane and and we can't use it anymore. It's probably a planter box by this time. And uh, so now we use a remotely operated vehicle, an ROV, to to look at fish populations. So um, we're doing that, and uh, we're looking at the effects. This is pretty cool. So there's going to be offshore wind farms off of California at some point, and you have to transmit the energy from the wind farm to shore and you do that with submarine power cables, and those cables will have an electromagnetic field around them. You can't get rid of that field. And some marine organisms, like crabs, can actually detect the Earth's magnetic field. And so the question is, well, when they're walking around and they come up near the cable and there's this big field around it, what are the crabs going to do? Or what what are the sharks going to do? Or what are many organisms going to do? And and so we did some studies to, to see, well, what... What does a crab do when it's walking along and it comes across an energized power cable? And it turns out they don't do anything. They just don't care one way or another is the best we can figure out. But there was a real concern that they would, you know, walk on top of it and fry their little brains out or run away as fast as they could. And nope, they don't seem to do, seem to do anything. So uh, we're kind of getting into the, um, that end of things. And then I'm working with a professor at the at UC Berkeley about the genetics of rockfishes. Rockfishes were have been the the um, the shining light, as far as I'm concerned, as far as fishes are concerned. I actually have a tattoo of a cow cod on my arm, and uh, uh, I just love rockfishes. And and a lot of people have done genetic work, but he's doing some more refined work. So uh, we get to go out and actually catch them and. Uh, take little snippets of their tissue and then send them to him. And it's an excuse to go fishing, which, you know, everybody in this lab, I think just about everybody in this lab is into fishing. Not everybody, but most people. And some of them are more than others. Uh, not only do we have an ex-skipper of a party boat, but we have a guy who uh, uh, who works in the lab most of the time, but he's also a deckhand on a party boat. So we have pretty close ties to uh, to that industry. Going going back to the oil platforms, um, what were some of the final results that you guys have found, or p- preliminary results about? Do you think they're beneficial? Or because I've actually been spearfishing under one before, and there were some pretty amazing fish down there, but I could only see what what I was holding my breath. <laughs> was this a uh, was this a platform off California or in the Gulf of Mexico or where was this it? was a platform um, near near Huntington Beach <clears throat> or Long Beach? Sorry. Oh, one of those. Shallow ones, Emmy or Eva, I think the ones that are in like thirty-five, forty feet of water, like those. Is that the ones? Yeah, they're pretty. Um, I think a little bit. Our, our boat wasn't that fast, but um, it wasn't super deep. I think we dove probably around between forty and and fifty feet, um, just free diving, holding our breath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it it depends on the platforms, but um, generally platforms are just, as far as fish are concerned, are just great big reefs. Mm-hmm. The uh, fish don't really care what the material is made out of, if it's a place that they can associate with or in some cases hide in, not all cases, but some cases, then um, they're fine with it. And so platforms are just like a whole lot of stuff, you know, from the surface to a, to the, the seafloor. And uh, some of those platforms are in 1,000 feet of water or 1,200 feet of water, so there's an awful lot of stuff. And uh, you tend to find 
around most platforms. Uh, fairly high densities of fishes, all all kinds of fishes. Uh, everything from what you'd expect in the shallow parts of the platforms, like uh, kelp bass and uh, sheephead and, and garibaldi, stuff like that. And then down near the bottom, you tend to find a whole bunch of fishes that um, like to live uh, like in crevices, because the bottom of platforms often have uh, a cross beam that's undercut, uh, so it's not touching the seafloor, and it forms like a cave. And so you tend to get, um, depending on the depth, but you get like Boccaccio and uh, vermilion rockfish, you know, red snapper, not a real red snapper, but a rockfish, cow cods, things like that, and uh, lingcod. And, and that's not every platform, but it's a, a majority of the platforms. All platforms have pretty high densities of fishes around them, some more than others. And in some years, you get more uh, higher densities than in, than in other years. Most platforms, the major function is that they're great nursery grounds for young rock fishes, among other things. And uh, you get... You, you often get far higher densities of like baby boccaccio around a platform than you will at at natural reefs, and that's just because if you're a little boccaccio and you want to settle out on something and you don't really care what it is, and maybe you're oh 50 feet below the the, the water line, uh, you're much more likely to encounter a platform which covers the entire water column than you are to cover to to find some. Uh, near shore reef uh, that's uh, it, where you have to get all the way inshore and you may get eaten before you hit the the near shore and whereas the platform is out in the middle of nowhere and maybe you won't get eaten as fast and there's a various reasons but uh, I mean uh, the, the bottom line is that platforms tend to act just like great big reefs we have a lot of people who might be first with fishing but don't know too much about you know fish anatomy or their sleep cycles or eating do you have like a kind of general overview the the reality is that the term fish covers such a wide range of animals that it's very hard to generalize in fact any statement you make that you think all fish encompass it turns out they don't i mean even things like well all fish have eyes well nope they're blind cave fish they don't have eyes oh okay 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 all fish have to stay underwater. Nope. No, it turns out that uh, Periophthalmus, the mudskipper, which lives... Actually, I just saw them, them in Australia. They live uh, on uh, mudflats uh, along the ocean. If you put a mudskipper underwater, it'll drown. Uh, it actually has to be in the air a majority of the time. They actually breathe air. So it's very hard to generalize about fish in general. I mean, if you... If you talk about fish in, the, in terms of things that people catch, so like kelp bass and sand bass and rockfish and mackerel and bonita and barracuda, those are all fairly closely related. And even there you can't make a, a complete statement, like, um, like sheephead. Sheephead uh, sleep at night. They actually go down into rocks and, uh, you know, kind of pass out. Um, that's not true for a lot of other fish. They're uh, at least semi-alert both day and night. Um, some fishes are much more active at dawn and at dusk than other species, which may be uh, active at night or even active during the middle of the day. When, when we uh, would take our little two-person submarine down into let's say 400 feet of water onto a rock pile uh, there would be maybe 10 or 15 species of fish 20 species of fish and most of them rockfish of various sorts and you could actually see as it got darker and darker say an hour before sunset you could actually see the fish slow down and, and start to settle down and by the time it was just about sunset everybody would be out of the water column everybody would be sitting in a cave or just hunkered down on a rock or even on the mud and they wouldn't really move until um, uh, just after sunrise so uh, that's true for many species but certainly not true for all of them at the extreme the senorita which is a, a little wrasse that uh, is related to a sheephead it actually buries itself in the sand 
at night. Uh, at, at around sunset, you can see them kind of spinning around in, uh, not in, in figure eights exactly, but close to it. And then all of a sudden they just plow themselves right into the sand and completely bury themselves in the sand and won't come out until uh, light levels uh, go up again in, in the morning. So, golly gee, it's, uh, it's just really hard to, uh, <laughs> to generalize uh, about fish. I mean, if you ask me about specific ones, I'll, I'll make something up for you. Uh, is there any other misconceptions that you kind of get frustrated when people talk about fish or over the years? Is there any things you want to clear up? Huh. I, I don't know. Um, just offhand, no. I mean, uh, the great debate, and I'm not even going to weigh in on it, the great debate is do fish feel pain? And um, I, actually, I just don't know. And uh, the research on that is uh, uh, it's not terribly convincing either way. So, and I'm not even sure how, you know, you, you measure, do you feel pain or not if you're, a, if you're a fish? So I do know that I remember I, uh, I caught a, a, a small halibut back around 1964 off of Playa del Rey by, you know, by Santa Monica. And the deckhand gaffed it, and it popped off the gaff, popped off the hook. And on the next drift over the same area, I caught the same fish. And part of me is going like, well, being stuck by a gaff would have hurt me enough that I don't know if I would have gone and tried to eat another anchovy immediately. I would have tried to rest up a bit, but maybe for a fish it's not the same experience or maybe it is and the fish was just damn hungry and decided to feed no matter what it was feeling so i don't know i mean that that's one where people argue all the time all the time and i don't think any any consensus has been reached on that one is there um a, any kind of similar nervous system that you know is kind of comparable to us yeah yeah it, so the nervous system is is very similar. It's very similar in in vertebrates in general, birds and amphibians and reptiles. As far as I know, I'm not an expert on amphibians or reptiles, but um, the the parts of the brain that are enlarged are different in fish. Often, um, it's the uh, lobes that are dealing with the sense of smell or the sense of sight or um, uh, the ability to detect water motion or things like that. So those might be uh, enlarged over what mammals or in particular we have. But most of the stuff is there. They don't have much of a, of a frontal lobe. So uh, people have argued that because of that, um, kind of the higher functions of consciousness may not exist in fish, but oof, that's just... Uh, that's not uh, that's a higher pay grade than uh, than I have. That's for sure. How about how about the state state of our um, fisheries? Do you have any info on you know are we heavily depleted or what should we be doing to fix it? That kind of stuff. Yeah, right. Well, um, th- th- there's actually been, and this is a rarity in fisheries management. There's actually been some kind of positive signs off California and in fact off the west coast of the United States as far as uh, uh, rock fishes are concerned um, if you look in the mid 90s uh, a number of species were just plain overfished I mean they were down to four or five or six percent of their unfished levels so that was way down and the federal government was forced to uh, enact uh, draconian laws as most fishermen know all of a sudden there's all of these areas off Southern California where ain't nobody can fish, period, the cow cod conservation area. And, and then uh, they installed, uh, you know, ain't nobody fishes on the bottom in water deeper than whatever, 60 fathoms or whatever. So there was a lot of areas there where you could not catch uh, any fish. You couldn't put a hook. Uh, and then they, they reduced the bag limits and, and so forth. And uh, that actually seemed to have worked, all of that. And then maybe, well, probably that uh, r- really did help. And now the feds are claiming that uh, a number of these overfish species are 
are back to levels where they can be uh, fished at a decent rate. That doesn't mean they're back to unfished levels or they're back to 50% of what they were, but they're high enough that the feds are loosening up on their uh, regulations. And it, it took much less time than than the models would have predicted. Some of those models were saying that for, um, like Boccaccio, you know, it might be, I can't remember, but it was decades, many decades, and it, it didn't take that long. Some species, however, uh, like yellow-eye rockfish, which is rare in Southern California, but, but more common as you go north, that one's still very overfished. Cow cod are still overfished. Um, so, so those things have, uh, some of those things, that's kind of a, uh, a bright point. It's a little harder to know with some other species because um, sometimes fishing pressure has very little to do with how abundant they are, like sardines. Most people agree that the sardine population is back in the toilet, and probably most of that did not have to do with, with fishing, commercial fishing. Probably most of that had to do with we entered a, a period where the water – uh, became relatively cold, and they don't reproduce well in cold water periods. Um, and and you can go back uh, 2,000 years, and you can see uh, periods when there were a lot of sardines, and periods where there weren't very many sardines, and ain't nobody fishing them 2,000 years ago very heavily at all. So that had to be due to to just natural cycles. So for some species like rockfishes, yep. It was probably due to people, but for other species like sardines, it was only partially due to to fishing pressure, and it was probably mostly due to the environment. So it really depends. Um, you can go back. I'm trying to think when I, we saw this. Was it in the 70s, maybe? There was a pretty healthy population of bonita off the coast, and uh, a commercial fishery developed, a persane fishery developed for them, and and the population seemed to decline really fast after that. So then the question is, well, was that due to the fishing pressure or the fact that Benita moved around a lot and they decided to go back to Baja, California? And I don't think uh, anybody knows. Oh, here's a good example. So I, I think a fairly good case can be made that the kind of wide-open gillnet fishery that occurred in the 60s and 70s probably did have something to do with the reduction in the white sea bass population, for instance, and probably the angel shark population. And then when um, much of the gill netting was banned, uh, the white sea bass population did come back. And people have argued, I, I think successfully, that some of that comeback was due to a reduction in, in the commercial fishing uh, take. So it's kind of a mixed bag. I must say, and I always do this when I'm talking about rockfish, that there's no question that the rockfish populations, all kinds of them, de declined in Southern California in from the 60s and 70s to the 90s. And that was due to both commercial fishing and sport fishing. I mean, people in both industries, they hate to think that. And I, having been in both industries, I can understand that. No one wants to go out and think, I'm going to go out and overfish a fish today, overfish a population. You don't want to think that, and, and people don't. But there's no que I don't think there's any question that um, you, you, you had a lot of commercial fishing in Southern California for rockfishes, and you had a lot of sport anglers on both party boats and on the private boats who were also fishing for rockfish. And that combination was just really harsh on some populations. So... Um, I just believe in kind of acknowledging one's role in something. Absolutely. Are there ways to redu reduce the fish mortality, like especially when you're um, fishing rockfish? Or is it pretty much there's no catch and release since they're coming from so far down all the way to the surface? Well, the, the conventional wisdom up until 10 or 15 years ago was exactly that. Oh, look, I brought up this cow cod or this boccaccio or this red and it's got bulgy eyes and its stomach is hanging out of its mouth if i put that fish back in the water and somehow got it back down to 500 feet it's dead and it turns out that's not the case um they've there's been an, a a lot of very nice work that shows that a substantial portion of those fish that you think 
just look dead. If you get them down promptly back to where you caught them, they will survive. Uh, not all of them, and it depends on the depth you get them at, and it depends on the species. Some species are just tougher than others. A yellowtail rockfish, which is rare in Southern California, but uh, common further north, they, you can get them out at 300 feet of water, and if you get them back down to the bottom, the vast majority will survive the experience. On the other hand, uh, I think that things like, uh, like vermilion rockfish, like reds, I don't know. Uh, some will. Definitely some will survive, but I don't know what the, the survivorship is. So, yes, I always say that, that people should carry some sort of device to, to get um, particularly rockfishes uh, back down as promptly as possible because um, a substantial number uh, may survive. What device do you recommend that people use? Which ones work best for you? They're all the same. I mean, I shouldn't say they're all the same, but um, seemingly uh, they all work. Uh, there's a, uh, a video called, uh, I think it's called Rockfish Barrow Trauma on YouTube that that a bunch of us participated in. My my rockfish puppet, I wasn't in it, but my rockfish puppet and my voice was in it. And Merritt McRae, a guy here who was a sport fishing skipper, and he actually is shown using a whole bunch of descending devices and showing how they all work. So I think it's uh, rockfish barrow trauma, B-A-R-A-U trauma, barrow trauma, or B-A-R-O-U, maybe it's that. Um, and, and, and that kind of sums up what, what, what we know. Now, as far as other fishes are concerned, you know, if you catch a kelp bass that's too small or, or you don't want the bonita or whatever it is, barracuda that's undersized, um, the, the key there is just the faster you get it back, the better, and the more gentle you handle it, the better. And if you can handle it with wet hands rather than dry hands, so you don't, uh, remove the slime from the outer part of the body because if you remove the slime, they tend to get infected with bacteria. You know, all of that thing, all of that, uh, just stuff that is like common sense will um, should increase the the survivorship. Have you ever heard of the um, California Fishing Passport? Basically has an outline of like all the different kinds of fish and invertebrates that you can catch in California. Have you, uh-huh. have you heard of it before? Well, I'm, of it. I'm aware of it. I haven't seen it. It's usually for kids. They have a massive section on rockfish, many of which I've never seen before, or at least until I read sure. your book. So outside of some of the knowledge from your book that I have to reread every time I <laughs> go out and try and catch some of these right. things, do you have any, any specific recommendations to help catch some of these more uh, rare ones? Because I've only oh, yeah. caught vermilion, um, and I haven't really seen especially even on the party boats, most of the other types of rockfish. So I'm curious, uh, what are your, some of your tips and tricks to get like a quill back oh. or, or something like that? Oh, well, I mean, things, some things, are, you know, like a quill back, there's probably three of them in all of Southern California. So that ain't going to work. But th- there are species that are extremely abundant in Southern California that most people don't catch, and that's because they use the hooks that are too big. If you use sabikis and, uh, and, you know, with whatever, number eight or number 16 hooks, y- you stand the chance of getting all kinds of little oobly-goobly things that you didn't even know uh, were there. Now, the, the professionals who do this, and like, you're going like, well, who's a professional trying to catch a fish that's six inches long? Like the, the collectors at the Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, who, who want to catch little rockfish, so what they do is they take a sabiki and they, they cut the hooks off and uh, put them on uh, higher pound tests so that instead of being six pound test, it's 20 pound test, for instance. So they make their own sabikis because if you use six pound tests, what's going to happen is, uh, yes, well, one of two things will happen. Either you will catch a six inch long fish and as you're bringing it up, a vermilion will come and pull on the fish and the hook will come off and you'll come up with no hooks. Uh, or you will uh, uh, hook a, uh, you know, lip hook a vermilion on your six pound test and then it'll snap the hook off. One way or another, you're not going to come back with hooks some of the time. So if, if you, you know, if you're really into it, 
you buy yourself some sabikis and get some 20 pound test or, or whatever will fit through the, through the hook head there and, uh, make your own ganyans up. Um, uh, I mean, I, I've done it with just old sabikis and you go out to some of these reefs in like, Oh, 150 feet of water, 120 feet of water. And you'll get square spot rockfish and you'll get calico rockfish and you'll get rosies and you'll get, um, half bandits and you'll get little blues and, uh, uh, little baby boccaccios, you get all kinds of stuff. And uh, in many cases, if you're using a, whatever you use, a 3.0 or, or a 1.0, or I don't know what people use now, um, you're not going to get those very often. So uh, that's that's the first thing. And, of course, the other thing is is the depth you fish at. Uh, Rockfishes uh, all have a depth preference, and they're all different. So if you're out there fishing for 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 vermilions in, uh, I don't know, 250, 300, 350 feet of water. Uh, and that's all you fish. Then there's a whole bunch of rockfish shallower and a whole bunch of rockfish deeper that, that, uh, you're just not going to catch. So in certain cases, of course, you're not allowed to fish deeper and, uh, the state still prevents that. Um, but you can fish shallower and, uh, so you you go to some of these um, shallow reefs like at uh, at Palos Verdes, and there's gophers, and there's black and yellows, and there's olives. And if you fish in two feet of water, there's grass rockfish. And you fish out in the kelp, there's or even in the rocks in 40 feet of water, there's uh, kelp rockfish, blue rockfish. Uh, so so there you know there's a whole bunch of shallow ones that that you can target. Um, sometimes even from from the rocks, you can get commonly you can get grass bass from the from the rocks, and even occasionally a gopher or black and yellow or kelp. That's more common if you go up to San Simeon or um, Central California. But even down here, um, you can get them. You lose a lot of gear though trying. That's for sure. I would never have thought of that kind of approach. Do you have any other like kind of uncommon? tips <laughs> like that sabiki rig um not um, just for rockfish for, for, but for any any other style of of hard to catch fish that you've learned over the years um well when i was a kid and um so uh, when i was a kid the only place the only party boats i fished out of were basically santa monica and then really occasionally like twice redondo and a few times malibu and three times Paradise Cove because I, until I was like 17, I couldn't drive. So, but I could walk to the Santa Monica pier. And so most of my fishing experience was fishing what I now know to the, to be the edge of the um, Santa Monica submarine Canyon, which is where most of the rocky areas were. And and by the way, you know, in thinking about it, those skippers were flaming amazing. These people, they didn't have Loran and they didn't have GPS and, so what did they have? They had a primitive strip chart fathometer and they had a compass and they had a watch, a wristwatch. And they'd leave the harbor and they'd go to about the end of the Santa Monica breakwater. And they knew where all of these small rock piles were on the edge of the canyon because they had memorized it and, and they had written it down and, and they would go, well, I know it's West Southwest and, uh, it's uh, 42 minutes at uh, cruising speed, and uh, I'll turn my meter on, and I'll just meter around until I find it. Or they would have landmarks up against the Santa Monica Mountains. Well, holy moly, if you're 10 miles out, and a lot of these spots are 10 miles out along that canyon, uh, it better be damn clear for you to see the uh, city hall of, uh, of Santa Monica in front of some blaze that's on Mount Wilson or whatever it is. So... I had to hand it to those folks. So in those days, I was just uh, fixated on catching the biggest fish I could, could either rock cod or, or even near shore. And uh, so I would just use the biggest damn thing I could find in the bait tank. And uh, even if I caught nothing, I would rather catch one big thing. Because I had my allowance at the time, this is like 1963, was I think a dollar a week. And it cost six dollars and fifty cents for the all-day boat, for the Indiana. That was the all-day boat. Now let me think. It was the 
there's the bright, there's the bright two, Orrin Winfield running the bright two, and uh, it cost six dollars and fifty cents. Well, I could never get out. It would take me two months, right? So I had to win the jackpot in order to keep going. So I just focused on the biggest damn thing I could get. So I just used big baits. When we fished rock cod, I was used nothing but uh, uh, Roger Dodger lures. That was the first lure that was heavy. It weighed a half a pound. And uh, it was made by the people at the Lincoln Pico Sport Fishing Store on Lincoln Boulevard in Santa Monica. And it cost a buck. And that was obviously a huge amount of money. And uh, there was times when I would go out and that's all I had, that lure. And <laughs> if I lost it, I didn't have the money to buy another one. So, yeah, I, uh, for, uh, I was fixated on big fish. So uh, I just used big lures and big baits. If I could find junk bait, if there was a tomcod or if there was a queen fish or holy moly, if there was a, a squid, there never was. But if there was a squid, uh, that's what I would focus on. I remember fishing... Um, off Play Del Rey, off what was called the pipe, which was, according to Oren Winfield, who was at the time 60 years old, he was a skipper, and he spent all of his time smoking and coughing, as I remember. I loved Oren Winfield. And he had been, he had gone to Santa Monica High School, just like me, but he was class of 1917. And he had been, get this, he had been running a sport fishing boat since 1923. And it was like, 1962. That's what the dude did, man. And, and that's the reason he knew every pebble in Santa Monica Bay. So, so it is a, a place called the pipe. And, uh, it, he said it was an old sewer line that I don't, I don't even know if it exists anymore, but it, it held humongous calico bass and the average size five or six pounds. And I mean, truly, I mean, there were, there were eight, nine pound fish there and very little, smaller than about three pounds and it almost never got fished he almost never fished it and i remember the first time he fished it uh if you used anchovies yeah you know you got the three and four pounders but if you found that one herring you know the queen fish that was the eight pounder and oh my god was that a kick oh geez i still remember that good old Oren. he was very patient with me i mean you know i was whatever 14 years old 15 years old and I'd get up onto the bridge. No one else did. And, uh, and he would, you know, just talk to me and cough. He would spend actually most time coughing, but, you know, talk to me about what fishing was like in 1933. And that was pretty trippy. Things had really changed. Do you remember any of his stories? Yeah. So, uh, back in the thirties, uh, giant sea bass were a dime a dozen. And, uh, they were they were just everywhere, and he uh, for a short time he he was he actually operated the barge which was located. They moved it a lot, but but it was located let's say a mile and a half off the Santa Monica Pier or the Ocean Park Pier, which was also a fishing pier at the time. And you'd take a little water taxi out there. I can't remember if it ran every half hour, or every hour, and you'd pay for a day's worth of fishing. And there were um, he said there were so many giant sea bass at the time that they allotted the bow of the barge to the black sea bass fishermen so that they didn't interfere with everybody else. So if you want to catch giant sea bass, that's where you fished and you'd put a whole barracuda on or whatever. And, um, you weren't guaranteed of catching a giant sea bass, but it was common. It wasn't like, Oh, look. So, you know, things had really changed by the time, you know, the late fifties occurred when I started fishing on those boats, a giant sea bass was almost, I mean, it was like a twice a year, three times a year thing. So things had really changed. And of course, the other thing that occurred is that around 1950, I think it became illegal to sell fish that you caught on a party boat in California. Before that, you could go out and, and you caught fish and you'd you could sell them when he got back to the dock. And a lot of kids did that. A ton of kids did that. And I did that, even though it was flat out illegal and I knew it was illegal. Uh, and there was a handful of us who would do that, not just kids, but adults. You, you know, you catch a, 
a yellowtail, and uh, which I didn't catch very often, but a yellowtail and some barracuda. And you go to the, when the boat came in at the Santa Monica Pier, there were two land, there were two floors to it, two decks, and the lower deck is where the first place when you came off the boat, you'd hit the lower deck, walk a couple steps, and then go up the the stairway to the upper deck. But there was a whole lower deck down there that was kind of invisible to the general public. And you just lay your gunny sack out and lay all the fish out and old ladies would come and, you know, you would sell fish. And if you kept your price reasonable, you could sell everything you caught. Not for very much in, I mean, by today's standards, but, uh, enough to pay for your next trip. And, uh, I never saw a warden ever. And there, there was just no enforcement at the time, as far as I know. So um, the the fish that were really valuable, a white sea bass, that was like, that was super valuable. And uh, you could get, well, I mean, I never saw a 40-pounder, but for like a 10 or 15-pound fish, you could probably get three or four bucks. A halibut, 10-pound halibut, three or four bucks. Uh, a yellowtail, a couple bucks. Um, rockfish, quarter a piece for a boccaccio. Get a cow cod, you might get. I don't know, 75 cents or something. But, you know, that would build up. A uh, half-day trip was, what was it, three and a half dollars I think, or four dollars, four dollars, and an all-day trip, six and a half. So if you caught, uh, you know, there were still bag limits, which was unfortunate because it limited your profit for the day. But uh, even with those bag limits, you could do, you know, you could do okay. So that was, that was jolly. It was the Wild West and and actually, to a certain extent, sport fishing off California still is the Wild West if you talk to deckhands and people like that. But back then, it was like no holds barred on those boats. Oh, my God. It was such a kick. Jeez. That sounds fascinating. Well, how, how do I you... really miss that. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you mean it's still like the Wild West today? Oh, I think that there's still uh, a fair amount of... Uh, how can we get the maximum number of dollars out of the passengers? And, uh, oh, let's claim that the entire jackpot really should go to the crew. And maybe the guy will or the woman will fall for that. Who knows? Let's try that. And, oh, you don't want your fish cleaned at the end of the day? Well, we're going to kind of ignore you for the rest of the day. How about that? I mean, there's still that, that kind of stuff, which... You know, on one level, you're going like, oh, that's unfortunate. But on the other level, you're going like, you know, it's just kind of retro. It's kind of cool. Yeah. And and the, the thing that is different is that the people running the boats uh, tend to be different now. They tend to be uh, somewhat better educated or very much better educated. Uh, back in the day, in the when I started in the 50s, uh, these were people who would, graduated high school and that was it. And, uh, they had either started like Oren did as a, a sport fishing skipper in the twenties, or they had started, um, as a commercial fisherman and then, uh, migrated into something where the paycheck was more consistent and the hours weren't as horrible as, as being, uh, most commercial fishermen, you know, was and is that's a really, that's a really rugged job. So, um, and then the deckhands tended to be either kids who probably, or, or who did go up, grow up into the industry or old men who are alcoholics. And this is the only job they could hold down. Like Murray. I, did, I assume Murray had a last name, but no, I, I have no idea what it was. He was Oren's uh, deckhand and, uh, uh, he was probably in his sixties. I'm not saying he was an alcoholic. He, he may not have been, but um, here's like a guy who's like 60 years old who's a deckhand making $10 a day. Hmm, no, I don't know. Just just saying. So, uh, but a very good deckhand. I'm not saying he wasn't good, but uh, clearly he had been in the industry uh, a very long time too. It was, uh, you know, it was just really... And, and the the boats themselves, most of the boats had been built around the turn of the century, like 1902. And so some of them had uh, n no interior galleys. 
in fact, no galleys. In certain cases, uh, the skipper sat on top of the wheelhouse in the rain, in the wind, uh, uh, in the sun, you know, uh, collecting melanomas. Uh, the, the passengers, yeah, there was a kind of a bench that went around the inside of the, the rail, but if it was sloppy, the bench was wet, so you kind of huddled around the wheelhouse as best you could, and it was, I don't know, and, and none of us were going like, well, this sucks, this is horrible, why, why don't we have better, because in Santa Monica, uh, you didn't know there was better, and there was, by that time, uh, you went down to, uh, to San Diego, and there was the qualifier, and there was the Point Loma, and there was, um, you know, pretty trick boats. And uh, none of that existed at uh, Santa Monica Sport Fishing. In fact, you could go 10 miles north to Malibu, and there was the Lenbrook, and even that one had a, was palatial compared to, to what we had in Santa Monica. I'm probably putting a rosy picture on the whole thing, but I, in some ways I do, uh, well, I just I do miss it. The fishing wasn't all that good, actually, because Santa Monica does not have a lot of reefs. Uh, in the near shore. So uh, the reefs it has tended to get pounded a lot. And so it wasn't like it was exquisite fishing, but um, shoot, what did I know? I was 14 and, you know, you catch six sand bass with the average size of 12 inches. You go like, this is fabulous because that's what you know. It's like fabulous. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I really enjoy the nostalgia. That makes me, I wish uh, I can experience that. That sounds amazing. It, it was, and an, an, probably the most amazing thing that occurred during that time was the El Nino of 57, 58. Uh, there hadn't been, well, no one called it an El Nino at the time. And I don't think marine biologists or oceanographers had actually figured out what was going on. Even then, uh, it turned out that the last big warm water pulse that came up was 1933. So it had been a long time. And all I, I mean, the first that I knew of it was my dad would read the fish reports in the LA times. And he was reading them and he went, he, he said, they got uh, 14 Barracuda on the Malibu pier. And, and we're both going like, what? Cause Barracuda were just not common, even on the party boats, let alone on the pier. And that was the first, uh, the first, uh, uh, inference that anything was changing. And then, uh, that was probably, I, I, you know, and my memory is probably like May. And then by June or July, it was like balls to the wall, uh, Barracuda and small Bonita. And they were everywhere. I remember going out and Orrin Winfield tried to get away from them. He, he, he tried drifting for halibut off of uh, uh, where Sunset Boulevard comes down to hit the ocean. That's a pretty good place for halibut. And uh, we couldn't get through. You couldn't keep your, your bait away from Barracuda. The Barracuda. You know, you're drifting in 10 feet of water, and there was Barracuda at the bottom, Barracuda at the top, and some mackerel, and there was Bonita. And, I mean, they were just fucking everywhere. And by the time September rolled around, passengers were getting tired of Barracuda and tire. And then Benita became really big in the next couple of years. And it was the same thing for the first couple of times you're going like, yay, Benita. And then you go like, boo, I just want to catch me a sand bass and I can't get through the Benita. So, uh, but, 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 you know, observing it from this distance, it was amazing. There was about a, in my mind, about a month period in the summer when there was a run of, of white sea bass, Uh, at the Santa Monica Pier. There were so many white sea bass being caught that the city, or I don't know, somebody actually hung gaffs from the light standard at the lower deck of the Santa Monica Pier for the use of the pier fishermen because they were getting 20 or 30 pound sea bass and they couldn't get them up onto the pier. You you know, there would be a net that would be useful for small halibut, but you, you can't put a three and a half foot long giant sea bass in a net. So, um, there was just, so what people would do there at the same time, there was a run of sardines, a small run, nothing like in the forties, but a small run. 
and uh, you would uh, use uh, Lucky Joes, which were the same thing as Subikis with heavier line, basically. You'd use a Lucky Joe, and you'd catch a sardine, and then you'd use the sar- and then you'd fly line a sardine out from the, the end of the pier, and uh, and that's how people were were catching uh, catching white sea bass, and that was all related to uh, to the El Nino that occurred. And then by the end of '58, things had kind of settled down as El Ninos do, and you go back to cold water, and it's just a fond memory by that time. That sounds insane. <laughs> I would love to be catching white it sea was, bass it, off the pier. It was insane. I would love to be gaffing one. Um, I was really interested in, I know I've seen some of the stuff that the government puts out for, you know, what fish not to eat or how many servings. Is there any fish that you believe shouldn't be eaten that, you know, or fish that we shouldn't even go after at this point? Maybe like, you know, swordfish or something. Um, there's no species that I don't think you can go after. So let's take a step back. So, um, one of the warnings is has to do with methylmercury in in fish flesh, and the general the general rule is the bigger the fish, and the longer it lives, the more likely it is to have relatively high levels of methylmercury. And um, uh, you know, if you're the person who eats like swordfish every single day, I'd go like, well, that's not a good idea. But if you go like, well, once a month, I'm going to eat myself some swordfish and you're not like a pregnant woman, I'd go like, I don't think it matters. Um, so it depends on the quantity that you know, you're know you consuming. Uh, the lower on the food chain the fish is, the less mercury it'll have. So uh, sardines will have less mercury. You can eat an awful lot of sardines, uh, and you're not going to get much mercury in you. Um, but the other, the other probably more valid question is, are there places from which you shouldn't eat fish? And uh, I think uh, there's a, a concern that if you eat things, oh, like older rockfish from Puget Sound, for instance, where historically there's been a lot of uh, pollutants dumped in the sound and there's not complete... Um, uh, mixing of the water. The, the water doesn't all like leave Puget Sound and go out into the Pacific. Kind of gets trapped in there. Um, or particularly in the old days, catching a fish out of Long Beach Harbor. Probably not as much of a problem now, but still, I don't know. I'm not sure I'd eat a fish out of Long Beach Harbor or, uh, you know, even San Diego Bay. I don't know. But having said that, you know, if you ate a white croaker from Long Beach Harbor once, I, I don't think your body cares one way or another, but it's the amount of consumption that is probably important and, and the species. I, I, I don't fall on the, uh, you know, the sky is falling with pollution. I, there's just far more, there's just far more important things like global warming and ocean acidification. I mean, those things are going to alter our society. Whether we eat swordfish once a month, like, who cares? Nobody cares. Your body doesn't care. Right. Do you have any uh, comments on what we should do uh, individually to, pr- to help with this whole global warming thing? Well, I mean, every time we, I talk to anybody in these circumstances about global warming, it inevitably gets into politics. So do you want to get into politics? If you don't, then we can just stop now. I, I gave a talk to the Explore oh, what were they called? The Explorers Club? Some some club in LA. And I talked about uh uh my findings of, about fishes around oil platforms. And uh people ask me start asking me questions at the end. They asked about global warming and and I just answered honestly. And then afterwards, some member came up and said, we don't talk about uh, politics here. And I'm going like, well, okay, then I won't say anything about global warming. I'm all about freedom so, of thought. So I would like the truth I don't know. I mean, to be out, to be it, honest. It, That's yeah, just well, me. Global warming is real. There's no question it's happening. And uh, if you vote for people who do not vote, believe in global warming, you're not helping. You're not helping the situation at all. 
because it's going to take concerted efforts on the parts of the countries all over the world, changing their behaviors, changing the behaviors of corporations as far as uh, emitting carbon, all of those things. It's going to take all of us pulling together, and you have the United States that is pulling in the opposite direction. So that would be the single best thing you could do to decrease global warming is to have an administration that actually believes that this is real, that actually believes in science. There, that's it. We have an administration that doesn't believe in in facts. So I don't think I have to say anything more. I think that's perfect. Um, If uh, you had an opportunity to have a billboard and it's shown to the whole world, what would you want on it? (laughs) Really? And it, it could say anything? Anything you ever wanted. Wow. Cuss words and all. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, it would be milk chocolate is drek. Drek is uh, Yiddish for crap. That I'm would, guessing you're a dark chocolate fan. I'm a dark chocolate man. And, in fact, even the 72% that my wife likes, I go like, Still too right. too little. I, I, I like the 95%. Had, just give me the coca. No, see, the, <laughs> there you go, man. I was at, uh, she and I went to the Theo Chocolate Factory up in uh, Fremont, up near Seattle. And we took the tour, and they, they give you samples of various ones. And we had the, we both had the 91% Ghana. And it was like eating dirt, but it was like eating really, really good dirt. Oh, my God. So I'm, a, I'm like a, for a daily on a daily basis, something between eighty and eighty five percent. So so if I had that billboard, I mean I'm not gonna change people's behavior by you know, saying, you know, global warming is real or what I, I would uh, I would try to just change the culture so that we don't uh, we we're, we're just not wallowing in milk chocolate, which is just so it's just de classe. It's it if we if we think that we're the number one nation in the world and I'm not sure we are, but if, if you if people think that, they should not be eating milk chocolate. There, that comes down to it. <laughs> That's the best answer ever. Um, there you go. All right, so how can how can people find you? Um, or maybe any oh, potential well, opportunities see. for to help out with your research or any of that cool yeah. stuff? Well, I mean, the first thing is, if people have questions about fish, they can email me. Uh, if you type in... <laughs> If you type in Love Lab, you will get all sorts of pornography sites. But if you type in Love Lab UCSB, you'll get my webpage. And I think my, my uh, email address is on it, but it's uh, uh, love, L-O-V-E, at uh, lifesci, L-I-F-E-S-C-I, dot U-C-S-B, dot E-D-U. So people can email me. You got questions about fish? I'm, I just sit here and with my hands folded on my lap, waiting for people to contact me. So um, there's that. I've got some books. Uh, The one that most people, well, they like them all, but the one that most people buy is um, certainly more than you want to know about the fishes of the Pacific Coast, and you can get that on Amazon or whatever, and you can actually get it from me so I can sign it, and I'll actually kiss it if you want. (laughs) with um, Burt's Bees lipstick. And uh, so that's available from uh, my press, which is really big press. So if you type any of that stuff in, you know, you can get to me and get the book and uh, like that. As far as um, helping out in research, nothing uh, strikes me that that, uh, a person could do to help my lab, but there are um, kind of citizen science groups um, there's one called Reef Check, for instance, which trains people who are scuba divers to go and count fish on um, on shallow water reefs, for instance. So that's Reef Check, and there's another one whose name escapes me. Um, and they do pretty good work. Um, people have actually compared the surveys that these citizen scientists are doing with what trained biologists do, and it's kind of the same thing. So 
uh, if you want to get involved, there's there's always training sessions, and and that's a good thing. It's kind of fun. People who are involved are usually interesting folks. So that's a thought. The other thing is that if you're uh, thinking about being a marine biologist, by golly gee, just just go do it. Just uh, you're probably only going to go around once in life, and if you do actually come back, you're going to come back as a slime mold. And you can't be a marine biologist if you're a slime mold, I don't think. So, I mean, I just encourage people. I mean, there are people who are like 30 years old going like, wow, I really wanted to be a marine biologist when I was a kid, but then I'm selling buttons online and I hate it. And I'm going like, well, just go back to school. Be a marine biologist. It's okay. It's not that hard. Anyone, if I can be a marine biologist, by doggy, anybody can be a marine biologist. So, uh, yeah. You're talking to one of those 30-somethings. I actually went to UC San, San Diego, and I was going to be a marine biologist, but I uh, ended up doing a... Uh, I don't know. I went to be, go for uh, bioengineering and switched to mechanical, but now I'm 31, and I'm, I started a website about fish, so I'm doing it this way. <laughs> well, it, 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 if, if, if you're satisfied, I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise, but what's your BA in? Uh, I got a BS in mechanical and a master's in okay. uh, mechanical as well. Whew, so a lot of engineering. So if you wanted to go back and go into the more biological end, it wouldn't take you four years because you have all of this under division stuff and you probably have the math already done. I mean, yeah, it might take you a couple years, but it might be fun. Now and 50 years from now, or 50 years ago, is that there was a sense 50 years ago that you really, if you were older than 30 or 32 and you came out with a PhD, for instance, if you were older than that, you know, you weren't employable. But, but now, for most jobs, ain't nobody cares. You could be 50 and, you know, gotten your BA and, and people will employ you. I mean, it may not be at a high salary because with a BA, you generally don't get a high salary. But but uh, age is less a factor now than it ever was. Well, that does it for this episode of the podcast. Huge thank you to Professor Love. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. And can you believe it, everyone? It's almost the end of the year. So that means it's holiday time. It's New Year's time. I just wanted to wish you a happy holidays. Whatever you celebrate, I hope it's with the ones you love. And if I don't talk to you before the New Year's, happy New Year's. Be safe out there. And if you need a New Year's resolution, how about just find the time to go fish more. And if you haven't already done so, please take somebody fishing in 2020. It's going to change their life. And if you could do me a huge favor, please leave a comment and a rating on iTunes. It helps make sure people can find this podcast, and it helps me make sure that I'm putting out the best stuff for you. And until next time, tie lines, everyone. See ya.